that I hope will inspire others. Um, you all know, I'm sure, what's happened to Ai Weiwei. Or perhaps I should say we are all equally in the dark about what has happened to him, since he seems to have been made to disappear. It takes a while to do that. We know for sure that the main message that his arrest is meant to send is addressed to China's human rights community and to the regime's brave critics, and the message is no one is immune. The period since Liu Xiaobo's Nobel Prize has seen an increase in assaults on free expression and free speech. Liao Yiwu was denied permission to leave China to join us here for this festival. And two days ago, he sent us this message. Here's part of the message he sent. I cannot cross the ocean to New York City. This prison-like state has confined me. I am not alone. My friends Ran Yunfei, Liu Xiaobo, and Ai Weiwei are now suffering in prison. For those writers who speak out to me at the New York Literary Festival, even though we cannot meet, our hearts are bound together. At a certain venue in Norway in 2010, an empty chair was set on the stage for my old friend Liu Xiaobo. I can only hope that my writings, which serve as testimony on China's present and its history, deserve that empty chair. Thank you all. We're glad, on the other hand, that uh, Lan Yangke was able to make it to this festival, and you'll be hearing from him later. His novel, Serve the People, received one of my favorite reviews ever from the Chinese Central Propaganda Bureau. This novella, they wrote, slanders Mao Zedong and the army and is overflowing with sex. Do not distribute, pass around, comment on, excerpt from, or report on it. So we're particularly grateful that as a result of a letter from us to Ambassador Huntsman, he was granted expedited review for his US visa, which arrived just in time to get him here. And we're glad, therefore, that there's at least one place in Beijing where Penn has influence. At all events, then, Penn, uh, China is one of the places that inevitably draws our attention because it is the focus of our two major interests. On the one hand, it's home to one of the world's great literary civilizations, and the literature it is producing and has produced is one of the world's great treasures. Penn was built nearly 90 years ago on the premise that literary communities in every nation need to speak to and listen to one another, and that is the positive reason for our focus on China. But increasingly, and especially over the last half century, we've also been engaged with the defense of free expression at home and abroad. And as the center of a great culture of repressed expression, China is therefore on our radar screens for a negative reason as well. So we're delighted, I'm personally very delighted, that we have Zhang Ying Jia, herself a distinguished writer and media critic, with us tonight to speak about her country. Her book, China Pop, How Soap Operas, Tabloids, and Bestsellers Are Transforming a Culture, was, when it appeared in 1995, a fascinated introduction to a China very few of us here in the US knew anything about. But she was already well known to me, since Henry Finder, who's my partner, had published her essay on the Chinese soap opera uh, phenomenon yearnings in our journal Transition in 1992. As for Tide Players, her newest book, if you want to understand the astonishing developments in China's contemporary cultural life, as you should, there could be no surer or more entertaining guide than Zhao. Academics, writers, dissidents, taxi drivers, business moguls, all come alive in her vivid and enlightening portraits. Or at least that's what I wrote in my blurb on the back of the book. <laughs> Besides these books in English, she's the author of three collections of fiction and two non-fiction books, including the 80s, an award-winning cultural retrospective of that decade in China. She's a frequent commentator on Chinese television and has published widely in both Chinese and English for a variety of publications, including The New Yorker, where she is still edited by Henry Finder, uh, but also in The New York Times, Du Xu, and Wan Chang. She lives between Beijing and New York. When she's giving her talk, she'll be in conversation with uh, Ian Baruma, Jan Yanke, whom I mentioned, Linda Polman, and David Reif, and um, uh, Ian will be guiding that discussion. So uh, after she's spoken, she'll come off the stage, and they'll come on, and then we'll uh, go into the discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Zhang Ying Jia.
That's good. Thank you, Anthony. Um, good evening. Um, so China in two acts. Um, when Jakob Ossos, the director of this Penn Festival, first came up with this name for this event, uh, both of us thought of it in terms of the format. Uh, as in a piece of theater, in act one, I'll be on stage, and others will join me in act two. But the name has certain suge suggestive powers. So as I began to think about what I would say here, uh, it came to me that I would indeed talk about China. Talk about China in two acts. That is to say, I talk about how China has been constantly engaged in two simultaneous acts, because these two acts not only clash with one another, but also feed into each other and are the two sides of the same coin, which is a source of contradiction and confusion to a lot of people here who want some clarity. Um, in fact, even for a lot of Chinese, myself included, this China in two acts also gives us great headaches because everything has been changing so rapidly in such fantastic ways out there that sometimes you're not sure if you're in a spell or in the clouds. But let me try to explain. So all of us these days have been hearing a great deal about the rise of China. The press is full of um, restless reports about China's growth in the past 30 years which gives you a feeling that ever since China has gotten rid of Maoism, central planning, and opened its doors to the outside world, uh, it's just been taking off like a rocket. I'm sure many of you have heard data such as these. Um, please show the slides. So we have the graph here. Um, you know, in the last 30 years, China has pulled over 600 million people out of poverty. Uh, Chinese economy has grown 90 times bigger, per capita income has risen nearly tenfold, and uh, there's the large, largest scale of urbanization in human history. And currently China is the second largest economy in the world. The largest exporter, the biggest auto market, has the longest high-speed high rail system, has the largest um, foreign currency reserve by far in the world, and the list goes on. Predictions about China's future sounds equally impressive. Goldman Sachs predicts that China's economy will catch up with the U.S. by late 2020s, and others predict that this would happen even faster, like in 10 years or maybe even five. So you have China in Act One, and it's fabulous, shining China making a great leap forward, and this time it's for real. But then there's China in Act Two, this is the more disturbing, more secretive China everyone is worried about, or even scared of. Because first, when a huge economy like China's gobbles up uh, natural resources, it creates huge new pressures on the planet. And second, as of now, the Chinese model of development contains many elements that conflict with or defy Western models, such uh, even as it de delivers these amazing results. This China has been called um, various names, Leninist market, authoritarian capitalism, socialism with ca Chinese characteristics, ca capitalism with character, uh, Chinese characteristics. Whatever the name, it as, uh, as, at best has a very mixed image. So now let's see a couple of the images of this other China. The next uh, slide, please. Okay, this is air pollution. Now, when I was a child, I read a lot of Charles Dickens' novels, and I imagined the sky in London would look like this, but this is actually Beijing. Next slide. And um, this is a family of old people who were you know, uh, forced to be evicted to make way for high-rise um, developments and they're not um, often getting proper compensation. And you also hear about corruption, social injustice, crackdown, dissent, and all kinds of human rights abuses. What's more, according to the latest survey, 
the majority of China's growing middle class is actually unhappy with life. So China is actually booming with a great frown. Only 12% think they're thriving, 71% think they're struggling, and 17% think they're suffering. So um, the official paper, China Daily, thinks that um, the, the cause for this national melancholy is things like the pressure of modern life and increasing materialism. Um, the other factor, I think, maybe is the increasing divide between the rich and the poor. For example, the Gini coefficient has been rising for years and now is approaching alarming um, level. The, I think it's 0 0.47, so it's actually caught up with America. Um, the two countries are more, becoming more similar in, in more ways than you think. And what is the Chinese government's response to this? New rules in Beijing. So now uh, there's a ban on high-end um, billboards and all, all the out, outdoor advertising that promotes these uh, hedonistic, luxurious lifestyles because that makes average people feel bad. So for every shiny achievement, there's a gloomy, um, dark side that goes with it. Perhaps the best symbol of this is the Beijing Olympics in 2008. It's China's de debut party as a modern nation. The opening ceremony, as you all probably remember, was spectacular. Everything was managed to perfection, from the amazing amount of uh, Chinese gold medals to order to deliver blue sky and clean air. But the promise of free media coverage was not met, and demonstrators were told to register, but no official, not one official, permission was ever granted. Instead, the police used registration as a mousetrap to make arrest, uh, to identify troublemakers. So if you want to register for, to demonstrate, you must be a troublemaker. I know this because my own brother uh, is one of these troublemakers. 13 years ago, when he and his uh, dissident friends tried to register an uh, opposition party called China Democracy Party, they got rounded up and sentenced and my brother actually served a nine year sentence, um, prison term as a result and released only before the Olympics. During the Olympics, um, polluting construction projects had to shut down and many migrant workers ended up leaving Beijing to stay out of the way. The event was symbolic. In the shadow of the national glory or in the name of development, you can always crush the rights of certain individuals. Uh, or as someone else put it, in China's break, uh, breakneck developments, some necks did get broken. Now, how many necks? It's hard to say. Is it hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands? Well, China is a, number, is a country where numbers get very tricky. Um, numbers are overwhelming and numbers can always be dwarfed by even bigger numbers. And often numbers are not exact or trustworthy, and numbers are often a complete mis mystery. Meanwhile, the state is constantly calling people to take the interests of the whole into account. Uh, this is the constant referring in Chinese. In other words, please look at the, the big picture. What's important is make the pie bigger and prettier even though I get a much larger slice than you do and the flavor may not be to your liking. Uh, but still, the country on the whole would benefit and so you should take pride uh, in this whole pie. Hence, all Chinese should support Olympics. Anyone who tarnishes this moment and want to sabotage it is a spoiler, a selfish person or an enemy of the state. Incidentally and perhaps uh, ironically, my brother, even my brother, an enemy of the state, who was followed by two shifts of police 24 hours a day during the entire summer of Olympics, he still supported the Olympics and watched the games avidly and believed that this is a proud moment for China. So this ought to give you a sense of how divided and yet how complicated the China in two acts makes Chinese feel so many of us are caught 
between pride and outrage, happiness and misery. Despite its problems, many of us thought that the Olympics uh, might mark the critical moment when China would finally come out to join the modern world and grow more democratic. Instead, what happened afterwards is the world financial crisis triggered by Wall Street greed. The West was shaken. America suffered a steep fall, not just economically, but also morally. And the way it has handled the crisis and put Wall Street back on track has put the credibility of its political institutions in doubt. China, on the other hand, appears to have handled the crisis fabulously well with the swift and strong hand of the state and a large stimulus package. China seems to come out even stronger than before. This has profound implications. It has shifted psychological balances both in the West and in the East, in the South and in the North. In China, it has boosted the political confidence of the Communist Party leadership, along with Chinese nationalists and the new leftists, who had never ceased to nurse China's wounds about the century of humiliation at the Western hands, never stopped blaming Western imperialism and Western hegemony for China's ugly capitalism. And it has weakened the cause of the Chinese liberals who, fighting for freedom of speech and democracy, have always upheld America on their banner of idealism. So in the past couple of years, you find in the Chinese press a newly smug discourse on the Chinese model of development, Zhongguo Fadan Moshe. I was told a hundred books have been produced to propagate this China model. Maybe a thousand articles. I have sampled only a few, and to me, most of them are poorly, uh, poorly argued, convoluted, coy justification for the party state and authoritarian governance. However, for the moment at least, this China model discourse is riding on top of three decades of spectacular growth on the very human pride about China's achievements. And it's, about, uh, and it's also a sinister response to the, certain, to the moral crisis of Western capitalism. Meanwhile, um, a fierce and lively debate about values has been taking place inside China and civil rights continue to be a point of great tension and contention. Even as we watch in the last few months, the harshest wave of crackdowns uh, in, of recent years. But how much leverage does the international community have on China today? Let's take US-China relations. The economies of these two countries continue, uh, uh, were so intertwined that it had became um, a cliche years ago to say that we were bound together as the Siamese twins. Um, the exporter and the importer, the cheap Chinese good with happy American consumers and profiting US investors and corporations. So people seem to forget that Siamese twins is actually a disease <laughs> until the fi financial crisis. And that has not made, made it easier for the US to deal with this new rising Asian giant. So from the WikiLeaks, we overheard an anxious Hillary Clinton asking the Mandarin-speaking Australian Prime Minister, how do you deal toughly with your banker? Well, that's a very tough question to answer when China holds nearly a trillion US Treasury bonds. Let's see the next slide. Now, this is an uh, American cartoonist view about just how much American, uh, Obama has um, in talking about Chinese human rights abuse. I don't know if you can read the words there, but it's Hu Jintao holding the chains, and Obama say, trying to say, could we just for a moment talk about political prisoners? But ultimately, I think the answer to these questions of values and human rights lies not outside China, but in China, and with the Chinese people and the Chinese leaders. And because this is about their life and their future, 
Nowhere else have, been, uh, have these issues been debated and fought with as much passion and with a wider review, uh, of array of positions. The views as polarized and complicated as the situation. And the characters involved are four-dimensional, not black and white. So I'd like to briefly introduce a few of, the, few of them here. And since this is a pen event, the five individuals I've selected are all writers and artists who are also prominent public intellectuals in China. So let's start with Liu Xiaobo, the one you know the most. Liu was a literary critic and a young Turk in the 1980s with iconoclastic views about Chinese culture and traditions. And he made outrageous remarks, um, such as China needs 300 years of colonialism to make real changes, and other scathing remarks about Chinese culture. Uh, but then in 1989, he became a brief activist on Tiananmen and helped to negotiate um, peaceful withdrawals of the students. Next slide. That's him on the square. Uh, but then after that, he went in and out, out of prison. Um, and in the 20 years after Tiananmen, he lived a shadow existence on the margin, writing only on the internet and publishing on overseas Chinese press. Uh, let's go to the next. And here's Liu holding a, a piece of napkin uh, in his hands, which says in Chinese, edge ball, cha bian qiu. And this was in an interview right before the Chinese um, Olympics. And he wanted to use this uh, sports term to describe, to refer to the balancing act that a lot of Chinese critics do um, by pushing, pushing the, the uh, and challenging the, the regime just a little so that it might change a little, but you don't do it so radically so that you yourself will go overboard and end up in jail. And as we all know, of course, that's where he did end up when um, he started this Charter 08, calling for the end of the party state. But of course, he also ended up getting the Nobel Prize. Next. And that's the empty chair that um, Anthony already talked about. Um, the next one, the next individual I'm going to talk about is also a writer. Please go to the next. And his name is Wang Meng. And he's someone who uh, joined the Underground Communist Party at age 14. But then after um, the revolution when he suffered during Mao's purges and was banished to Xinjiang. This is the China's um, Muslim West, and lived there for 16 years until Mao died and he returned to Beijing and became a very successful writer. And in the 1980s, he served as the cultural minister. Please go to the next. And there's Wang Meng receiving members of the Indian um, government. And Wang is, is a very liberal minister. And um, he always pushed for reform and for more liberal policies in the arts. Uh, but then, in, Tian, in the wake of Tiananmen, he refused to visit the soldiers uh, cracking down on the square. And as a result, he was ousted. So in the 90s, he became a, a writer. But he and Liu Xiaobo had actually changed uh, quite nasty attacks at each other. Because Wang is a very has a very different view of China. He's someone you might describe as a moderate liberal. And his view of the present China is that you should take the long view. And this is the best period in Chinese history in the last 150 years. Wang is still loyal to the early ideals of the Chinese Revolution. And he wants China to stay stable and not falling apart like the Soviet Union. And he uh, supports a more prudent, gradualist form of change under the party leadership. So, the question is, is he an apologist uh, for, the, for the party, or is he a, a very valuable reformer within the system? Go to the next. And here's a, a New Yorker illustration for a profile that I did on Wang Meng, and as well as Liu Xiaobo. 
And here you can see that Wang Meng is also doing another kind of balancing act. And he's poised on, on top of the dragon um, with these colorful books. But um, Liu Xiaobo is, is being swallowed and trying to get out. But the thing is that Wang Meng is also precariously poised in danger of falling into it, the mouth of the dragon himself. But he's so careful that he basically publicly in China tends to stress the positive side of China today. The changes have been made and he stays within the censor zone. But he still is a liberal voice, uh, someone who has frequently advocated for cosmopolitanism, spoken against narrow-minded nationalism, and helped uh, many controversial young writers. The next figure let's go to is Yu Dan. Here is an, another uh, different voice. Yu Dan is a communication professor who lectured about Confucius analysts on CCTV, which is an instant hit. And she was nicknamed Confucius with lipstick. <laughs> She's someone who grew up steeped in Chinese, ancient Chinese classics. But one of her favorite movies is Mr. and Mrs. Smith. She switches with ease between teaching ancient wisdom, stressing non-material uh, value, and coaching commercial television on producing hit, hit shows. She talks with authority and formality of a party official, but she can engage her audience with personal anecdotes and very colorful, inspirational stories from all sources, Chinese and foreign, ancient and contemporary. So she admits that not everything about Confucius is relevant today, but it's not fair to emphasize only the negative. She says that Confucius also teaches love and tolerance and helps you have a spiritual anchor and self-confidence and have more harmonious relations with others. And this is part of the revival of Chinese traditional culture and quite popular among Chinese new middle class who wants to find roots in their own cultural identity. So there's a growing trend of reading Chinese classics at schools and at homes and Yu Dan's books sold millions. Go to the next. This is uh, one of her books, um, Confucius from the, Ar from the Heart, Ancient Wisdom for Today's World, the 10 million uh, copy international bestseller. Anyway, uh, as with almost everything today in China, she is very controversial. Go to the next. Here's a Chinese man. With, uh, who do, doesn't like her, and she's, he's wearing a protest t-shirt that says, this is fast food culture, and it's fooling the world and hurting the children. So Yu Dan is a praise, uh, praised as a great savvy promoter of a lost classical tradition, and mocked as a shallow self-help guru selling chicken soup for the heart. Some Chinese liberals also have questioned her intentions. Does she really want Chinese to be dull cell subjects or good citizens? Is she a new propaganda face of the, stu uh, of the state or a culture, cultural ambassador of China's new soft power? And let's see the next slide. Here you can see a statue of Confucius had been erected in front of uh, the National Museum near Tiananmen Square with soldiers on guard. And this is happening while hundreds of Confucius institutes are being set up abroad and all founded by the Chinese government. Go to the next. Meanwhile, uh, Yu Dan continues to be a very busy traveling lecturer across China and outside. Uh, the next one is a young blogger uh, named Han Han. And He's someone who was a high school dropout and very popular on the internet at first just for some um, best-selling campus romances. But then in the recent years, uh, Han Han has been, um, go to the next. He's a cool kid, he plays pool and next, and he's also a race car driver. So some people saw him as one of these, um, you know, teenage, sort of uh, uh, idols 
with a shrewd, trendy image uh, uh, building skill. But in recent years, he has grown into a very smart and serious social critic who began to take on China's leaders, corrupt officials, and many topical issues um, of injustice. And every one of his blog entries uh, attracts millions, over a million hits each. And he has a, a huge fan club and loyal following. So at age 29, he's already, as a, uh, he's, he's one of the most influential opinion leaders in China today. Uh, and uh, very popular among younger generation. And this says a lot, I think, about the future of China. Go to the next. And here comes Ai Weiwei. Now Ai Weiwei, like Han Han, was also an early school dropout, uh, both in China and in New York. He dropped out of Central Academy of Arts in Beijing to come to New York, and he actually took some courses at Parsons and dropped out uh, again. But he lived in New York, downtown New York, for 15 years, uh, where he became a guru to a bunch of you know, drug addicts and, and a lot of you know, bohemian artists. And he was an Andy Warhol enthusiast. So when he moved back to Beijing about 10 years ago, uh, he helped to design the bird's nest, this uh, uh, you know, uh, Olympics uh, uh, auditorium. And like young Liu Xiaobo, Ai Weiwei is also a iconoclast. So you can see from these this, uh, uh, photos that he was dropping a priceless Han Dynasty year to make a point. And next. So next, this is one of the three you know, uh, photos he took where he sticks out his own middle finger towards, here's, towards the White House. The other two is actually towards uh, Tiananmen and the Eiffel Tower. So you get the idea that this is a bad boy artist, a very aggressive provocator with an irreverent um, attitude towards tradition, high art, and symbols of power everywhere. So in some ways, Ai Weiwei is a postmodern version of Liu Xiaobo. He's more playful and media savvy and artful and maybe more cynical about both China and the West. Uh, the next two slides, just quickly, these are two other uh, exhibits he did. One, this one is called Fairy Tale, where he shipped um, a thousand and one Chinese citizens to a German exhibit. And next, um, sunflowers in Tate Modern Museum, uh, which is made up of a hundred millions of uh, sunflower seeds handcrafted in porcelain, each identical but actually unique. So this is another um, statement um, he made through art. But he could be just another brilliant global artist, a darling for a mostly Western audience. Until several years ago, stirred by a famous police abuse and murder case, Ai Weiwei started getting involved in China's civil rights movement. And that's where he got into serious trouble. He and his team began to investigate the numbers of Sichuan earthquake victims, and he began to post more political commentary on his blog. And when he tried to testify for a fellow rights advocate in Sichuan, he got beaten up by the police. But of course, as a performing, uh, performance artist, he photographed everything, including his own cracked skull. Next. Um, here's Ai Weiwei after he had a surgery for cerebral hemorrhage in a Munich hospital, four weeks after he was beaten up by the police. And that's the, the, the bag of blood drained from his own head. And after the censors shut down his blog, I uh, tweets daily on his Chinese macro blog um, and continues to speak out. He's, of course, also a controversial figure in China, loved and worshipped by many young liberals, uh, but irritated and is resented by many others. Some accused of him, uh, him of uh, manipulative and exploitative and viewed him as a shrewd, crazy self-promoter. And Ai Weiwei is certainly a media-savvy, global, globalized artist, and he does blur the lines between art, uh, performance, and protest. 
but the political seriousness and the personal risk he has taken in speaking out cannot be doubted. And detained weeks ago, maybe now he's paying a price finally for some of the gutsy, reckless antics of his. And let's go to the other photo. There's, this is one in a series of photographs he posted on his blog in 2009, showing himself nude, uh, except for a strategically placed toy horse. And the caption in Chinese, uh, you can't see it here, but the caption in Chinese uh, reads something like, red mud horse, blocks in the center. But this is actually a hilarious wordplay, turning a popular Chinese pun about censorship into a direct attack on the Communist Party. Because when you read it out loud, uh, it, 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 reads, it sounds like this. Fuck your mother, the party central committee. <laughs> well, that's not an edge ball. It's actually a dunk. Uh, and you can almost feel the, the, uh, who's wincing. Could this be the tipping points for him? I don't know. But I do know that the party is not known for having a sense of humor. And they wouldn't appreciate someone like Oscar Wilde, who says, life is too important to be taken seriously. So according to the Chinese press, one of the crimes Ai Weiwei is currently being charged is spreading pornography. Well, I hope these I think I'm running out of time, but the few sketchy stories should give you just the flavor of China today. And I wanted to say just finally, that when situation gets tough and we're all depressed by the setbacks and the darkness, that it's useful to recall just how repressive China had been in its history um, and how much progress has been made. So for that end, let me end with a final graph and a videotape. The next person you already know, then there's David Reif, uh, an American writer, journalist, columnist, uh, who's worked all over the world um, and is now working on a book about the global food crisis. To his right is Mr. Yen Yang Ke, uh, a novelist. Um, his, um, one of the, his novels has already been translated into English called Serve the People. Another one is on its way and to his right is his translator, and I uh, can't remember exactly your name. My name is Tina. Right, Tina. <laughs> okay, now, <clears throat> listening to the uh, presentation, several um, questions came to mind, which I'll put to the panel. Um, one was, what on earth um, uh, possesses uh, one of the most powerful and authoritarian governments in the world to be so scared of a performance artist? But that's not the first question that came to mind. Something that did, did, did immediately strike me, not for the first time, but is the fallacy of the common theory that many people believed um, for many, many years, which, especially this country, which was that with economic development and more capitalism, you develop a middle class and a middle class automatically starts demanding democracy. Now, that doesn't seem to have worked in China, just as it hasn't worked in Singapore, in many cases, the, the middle class is quite conservative and as frightened as the Chinese Communist Party is of what they call disorder and uh, so on. So I'd like to start, up, start with a question to Mr. Yen and perhaps ask him um, when or if the middle class in China um, is likely to, um, make, to put more pressure on the government to open up uh, and have democratic reforms. And linked to that question, um, would more democracy in China necessarily um, lighten up the dark side of development that, that we've just been hearing about? Uh, 
He says, I I'm very sorry. I thought I came to the US for a very lighthearted literary festival. And after listening to such a fascinating and accurate report, I have to talk about such a heavy topic. Uh, I think I sit here today, I think I have already put a knife on my neck. If I don't tell the truth, no one will kill me. And I feel like sitting here, there's a knife held to my neck. And if I don't, say, if I don't speak the truth, then the Americans will kill me. But if I speak the truth, my country might kill me. So I think today, so I think today I'm going to speak half truth and half lies and in my own way take that knife away from my neck. Uh, I did not grow up middle class. I actually don't really know what the middle class is. I know that you know there are 15 pushing 15 billion people in China, um, but most of them are actually you know still farmers. I think to solve the farmers, the, the agricultural people, their problems is really just to, is, is a better way to solve the problem than to approach it from the middle class. Yes, but that doesn't quite, I, I understand the knife at the neck, but let's, let's change the word from middle class to the educated uh, class, the educated urban class. What are they? How likely are they to press for more democracy in China? Uh, uh, 关于中国的教育, 我想其实有一个实际情况, 大家都已经忽视了。我现在已经调在中国的人民大学教书, 从此指导了一下的情况。我说关于教育的情况, 因为我调到人民大学去了。Oh, because I was sent to Renmin University to teach, I've actually had more experience and more insight into education in China. Fifteen years ago, 80% of university students came from villages. Uh, now it's 20% who come from villages and 80% come from urban, urban cities. Children who live in poverty can't afford education. Before every Every province had a high school. Uh, before every 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 province, entire province only had one high school. Now every town has a high school. I am a pessimist. I think whatever way you try to solve the China problem, it's not going to work. If I had the answer to how do you solve the China problem, I wouldn't be sitting here. I'd be a government official back in China. David Reef, what, what are your thoughts on the uh, developmentalist theory that, it's, that a middle class automatically leads to more democratic demands? And if that's not the case, what is your... Um, what are your feelings about this? Well, I, I mean, first of all, obviously, China's disproved a lot of ideas. China has scuppered the idea that the human rights movement was going to sweep all before it on commercial grounds alone. The current president of the Soros Foundation, Zari Nair, well known to many people in this audience, I think, wrote a piece 25 years ago in Foreign Affairs, uh, Foreign Policy Magazine, talking about how it was the, the economic pressure 
strategy that the human rights movement was concerned with would no longer work because the Chinese market had become too big and it was too important and therefore uh, there was the kind of pressurizing techniques that had been applied to small tyrannies were not going to work in China and indeed they did not and have not and to the contrary if you spend any time among intellectuals in places like New Delhi where I spent a fair bit of time of late, uh, the Chinese model is presented as an alternative to the liberal capitalist model. Uh, and it's, it's suggested, as you said, I thought absolutely correctly, the, the failure of the, the great Western uh, capitalist centers to cope competently with the crisis uh, is uh, proof. I don't, I don't think, the ba I, I don't actually think the thing that's a very funny cartoon about Obama and Hu Jintao. But in fact, there's an old saying in the banking business, if, if you owe the bank $10,000, it's your problem. If you owe the bank $10 million, it's the bank's problem. <laughs> so I'm by no means convinced that, that uh, Chinese, China holding trillion dollars in American paper is entirely Washington's problem. But, um, but having said that, I, I don't see, I, I think, this democracy, liberal, the sort of Western liberal idea of democracy, this end of history idea, we were already there, there would be no countervailing forces of any competence. The rest would be uh, sort of uh, people, stragglers, if you will, to use a kind of military image. And, and there would, in the end, we'd all become somewhere between I don't know, Washington and Oslo. Uh, that, that's a non-starter. The world is a very complicated place. There, it, it reminds me unpleasantly of the way 50 years ago, people assumed religious faith was going to wane everywhere in the world. I, I think a, a, a smarter approach is to say, there's no reason why there shouldn't be several versions of capitalism, or that the Chinese version shouldn't be um, a very powerful iteration of capitalism. And the other thing is, if we'll, we'll come back to your original question about the middle class, seeing as there's no knife that I can observe to my throat, um, I, I don't see what the interests of the middle class, and particularly those who want to join the middle class in China, which surely is a much larger number of people than the middle class itself, uh, I, I'm not quite so sure what, what their interest is in democracy. I hate to put you to work again, but perhaps um, you could answer that question and also t tell us what you think. Let's say there is an extraordinary development and party reformers actually manage to open up the system. There would be elections, there would, people would be allowed to form parties and so on. Do you think, um, let, and let's assume it worked, and it would be a, a, a more or less functioning democracy. Would that make the dark sides that you described better, necessarily? Would it um, create a, a less, less nationalistic atmosphere? Or would it not necessarily solve those problems? But this is a lot of questions, actually. Um, uh, let me first mention that yesterday I was called uh, by this TV show producer um, of Democracy Now! and who wondered whether I would uh, want to be interviewed uh, on their show. And she started by saying, look, we're very critical uh, by mainstream standard. So where's your position? And I, when I describe myself as a moderate liberal, I think she just wins. And uh, she said, I'll call you tomorrow. And, <laughs> and of course, I, because I, she didn't, and I don't fit, fit the bill. But what I'm saying is that um, people tend to um, have this notion that if you have democracy in terms of elections, that's going to solve problems. And that's not my view. Uh, uh, my view is that democracy now may not work. If you have democracy a little later, or maybe tomorrow, it might have a more chance to last. Um, because I think I grow up from the most radical time uh, under the most radical leader uh, in the 20th century. Um, which is Mao, uh, who's, uh, who's the leader of a, a, a great manipulator of populism. And um, as a result, we all know, 
Um, so I'm quite skeptical about radical uh, democ in, in terms of um, elections now in China. It's not, I'm not convinced they might elect, uh, not elect a, a, some leader who wants to, let's just, you know, liberate Taiwan and beat Japan. And, um, you know, uh, where that's going to bring us. That's one, quest, uh, one answer. The other is to your point about India. I happen to work for the Indian China Institute and travel a lot to India. And the first time we went there, all our Chinese liberals had hopes to learn lessons about the biggest democracy in Asia to bring home. Instead, we saw, we saw this giant uh, slums in Bombay and we were totally shocked. And it, this becomes a very tough sell at home to sell democracy. Um, when you, you do have um, this, this 30 years of growth with a middle class who had shifted um, to a more kind of, you might call a conventional way of you know, uh, changing slowly um, to some, someone else that might be selling out um, to be complicit to the, 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 the status quo. But I think that's the reality we have to face. And there is something that's been debated in China for years about this um, very volatile moment when the per, per, capita, uh, per capita GDP approaches $5,000. That's the most volatile moment of change because then you also you have the, uh, the enough, a sizable middle class with a stronger consciousness about their rights. And that's the moment maybe change might happen. Um, and we're approaching that in China now. I think the, the, the figure is uh, about 4,000 per, per capita GDP. And that might have explained something about why the regime is so jittery and paranoid about something like the Middle East, because we are approaching that moment. And things are you know, deeply corrupt. Um, and there's this party um, sitting there with you know, the blood, so much blood on his hand. Uh, there's, you know, there's never, uh, the, the victims have never been given a chance uh, of, to have a catharsis. And so there is all these skeletons from the history. So when you let loose of that, you also don't know what's gonna happen. Um, so there, I'm just only naming a few elements about why this is both a moment of great pride about achievements and a moment of great anxiety. And perhaps for a country that has a population more than uh, the total amount of um, Europe and America put together, you need to have a longer length of time. And I mean, how much time did it take uh, for Britain to go from Magna Carta to say the Glorious Revolution? You know, uh, 400 years maybe, um, 600 years, <laughs> thank you. And for China to go to, you know, from, a, there's not another major country in the world with um, 2,000 years of continuous central bureaucracy, a, a tradition of top-down uh, rule. And for all that totalitarian culture to change, I mean, this, we're talking about this year, two, 2011, is 100 years anniversary of the, you know, uh, the end of the last Qing dynasty, the last imperial China. It's only been a hundred years. So I, my attitude, maybe you disagree, is let's not always try to predict, you know, what ha uh, dependent on what happened in the space of five years or 10 years. It may be just a transition. And it could be, you know, a lot of pus um, before uh, a, a rotten wound actually burst. And this, this could be the darkest uh, moment before something turns. But I, I find it is fascinating, and what you're saying is, is indeed what, you, what most educated people in China will tell you. And it sounds uncannily like the arguments that a generation ago one would have heard from liberal officials in the colonial office of, of Britain running an empire which is, look how wonderfully we've done in terms of building railways and hospitals and universities, and this is something to be deeply proud of. And of course, independence would be a good thing, but it needs more time because the colonial peoples are no, not quite ready for it yet. It would be chaos and disorder. And so we have to wait until it, the time is there for them to 
uh, declare independence and do it responsibly. The problem, of course, is who decides when the time is right. And perhaps I can now turn to, to you, um, uh, unless you're bursting to answer this question. Uh, okay, well, why don't you ask a question? Um, um, you, you rightly said that changes uh, in China will, will have to come from the inside, it will have to come from Chinese people themselves. But is there anything the West could do to speed up the process? Like, for example, would it, would it have helped the human rights activists in, inside China if we would not have gone to the Beijing Olympic Games, for example? Would, would that have helped in, in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the pursuit of, uh, of the democracy and of human rights there? And another question I have is, are we, do you think that we are even obliged to pressurize China a lot more? Because it's not only unhappy people inside China, but the unhappiness is also exported to other places. Look at Burma, how, how much Burma is suffering under the, uh, under the, uh, the uh, support of China, of the Burmese regime. And look, look at Sudan, uh, China is also uh, spreading unhappiness there. So uh, can, can we do something to speed up the process? And should we do something to speed up the process? Perhaps you could take one of those questions and then Mr. Yen can take the other. Mm -hmm. the, you, you choose which one you want to answer. <laughs> Let him go first, because I've said okay. a lot, I think. <laughs> <laughs> <笑>我想回答一下关于民主的问题 I think uh, he wants to address the, uh, the question about changing from internally, the changing the people. And he thinks the problem with the Chinese people is probably the biggest, the most complex problem there is. Um, having lived 53 years as a Chinese writer, he thinks that the problem is Chinese people don't really care about human rights. They're very cold towards the idea of, of basic human rights. Mm -hmm. This kind of coldness, this kind of apathy towards human rights makes a lot of other people disappointed in them. Um, and I'm going to give an example. When Liu Xiaobo was arrested, he, a lot of people actually sympathized with him. When Liu Xiaobo won the Nobel Prize, everyone uh, when, when he won the Nobel Prize, everyone was very supportive and thought that he deserved it. Uh, People thought, with all that cash prize, I'd be willing to do something like that. Beijing大学一个非常重要的知名学者在和我谈起这件事情, <laughs> Some, uh, an academic from Beijing University told me something that shocked me. He said, what does all this have to do with our lives? Uh, and for example, when we see that Ai Weiwei is arrested, uh, we see that he has a long list of crimes. And one of these crimes is, you know, fraud. And when people read about how much money he, he deceived from the people, they think that he deserves to be arrested and locked up. For all those people who are struggling and fighting, 99% of the people in China don't really care about what they're doing. They care about their lives, they care about uh, money, they care about their basic need to survive. Uh, 
共同来关心这个问题。I think it's something that the intellectuals in China need to come together and, and, and support this problem. Uh, but now even the intellectuals are, are corrupt to a certain degree. Uh, China, today, I, I don't think the people in China have the, the intellect or the spirit they are not prepared for that yet. Uh, and I don't know who's, going, who's out there who has this intellect or the spirit to do this. Uh, for me, sitting here tonight, the things that I say will go back to China and I'll be laughed by the people. Um, they'll say that Yan Lian Ke is here just to promote his own name. Nobody is going to say Yan Lian Ke spoke the truth, thus we should respect him. I think uh, the degree of how apathetic the Chinese people are towards human rights is far beyond any of you can believe. Uh, before there was a slide about Wang Meng, the author, and his liberalism. Uh, even this kind of intellectual, this kind of mind, uh, the, the, uh, the people also kind of, they kind of make fun of him. So I'm a little bit writing out of despair. So I am writing out of my own despair. Uh, even though the kind of writing I do takes a very, very little, it's a very, very small part, small part of literature in China. Uh, even if you're, if you're an author with three banned books and your newest book can't be published, um, others around you will think that you are writing for some sort of benefit. In regards to democracy and freedom, I feel like all I can do is pick up my pen and write and not try to think about anything else. I feel like even today, I might not be able to see that day in my lifetime. Well, I, I think that people like Liu Xiaobo and Ai Weiwei are true warriors, whereas someone like me, I'm a, I'm a coward. I can't fight out loud like they do. All I can do is silently write. So to be a lonely writer in China is perhaps one of the luckiest things to do. Yeah. Um. Thank you. We have time for about one question, so it better be a good one. Um, you can come up to the microphone uh, there. Uh, anybody? Don't see any hands yet. You have a few more seconds. And, okay. human rights and democracy, but what about uh, the relationship of China to things like copyright law, uh, recognizing the, the Western approach to writers and rules of that nature? And uh, who, who, are you, who would you like to answer that question? A Chinese gentleman, for example. Okay. Yeah. 
I hope he understands the question right. because I, I, I didn't entirely understand the question. The question is what about copyright laws? The idea of China now recognizing Western standards in general, not only in terms of democracy itself, the view of the West and regulations and human rights, yes, but the, the framework within which the West looks at human conditions may be uh, personified by copyright laws, the rule of law in itself. You understand that? Kind of. Anyway, uh, Mr. Yen. Uh, it's, a, it's an ongoing fight uh, to bring Western standards of copyright into, into China. Uh, for, for Chinese writers, it, it's almost an honor to be pirated. It's kind of embarrassing if you haven't been pirated. <laughs> You're not truly successful until you've been pirated, and the more you, you sell pirated copies, perhaps the more money you're making. And I always think, since my books have been banned, why aren't there more pirated copies out there? <laughs> um, one question has been left uh, unanswered. Um, should the West have done more to, uh, to pressure China on the Olympics and similar issues? Yeah, I definitely think so. I think there should be a principled engagement um, that you engage with China, but don't you know, back off from principles. And, and there are times where I, I feel uh, be, especially since China's economic um, might um, and the Western weakness at the moment, there's a tendency to play a, some kind of appeasement um, towards China, and, um, and, and you, know, you can justify yourself out of that from the certain conventional uh, wisdom that I said, but I wanted to say that's not what I believe. Uh, I believe that you, unless you push, there's no change. Change won't come just by waiting. And um, I, uh, so I, I like um, someone like uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, um, who says, um, you know, action is always better than reaction. And when in doubt, just do it. And I think, you know, um, West sometimes has a tendency to be paralyzed by too much thinking and, uh, you know, speculation about its own interest and um, whatever it is. But in fact, that's just the excuse of not doing it. And this is not just for the sake of the Chinese, it's for the sake of the, the world. Because China is now, is poised on the brink of bringing this so-called alternative way of going. And that's just BS. I, I mean, at, at this point, just forget it. I, I, don't, I don't believe uh, China is there at all. And I actually believe this is maybe the time um, that you know, like I said before, that given, I, I actually have to say, I somewhat disagree with the, the total pessimism uh, of Yan Lin Ke, who uh, thinks maybe there's a racial um, flaw in the Chinese who just, you know, only cares about money and nothing else. I, I, I don't quite agree with that. In actually invoking um, Ian Baruma's uh, work earlier on uh, Japan and Germany, you could see in moments of, um, history, maybe, you know, a, a whole population seemed to be so cold-blooded and could go with a, a, a militaristic or Nazi leadership uh, because of economic wounds or economic interests. But in fact, what's critical is that change of the system. When we have that breakthrough, I'm sure there's all these Chinese that I've known um, around me who have that yearning, sometimes repressed, but it's there. When that breakthrough change comes, you will find out that the Chinese are just like everybody else. And they want to be more free, and they want not just money. I think that note we should end our session, because I don't think anybody could say it better. Thank you very much indeed.